an antique bulwark stretches across Europe, straight through northern England and Scotland. An airship is employed to help investigate it. Along the Rhine, warships secure the river borders where prosperous cities emerge. South of Bonn, from here on, a 550-kilometer-long barrier splits Germania in two. The border between the Roman Empire and the Barbaricum was the Limes. Scientists are employing high-tech and fantasy to try to unlock the secret of this barrier that is almost 2,000 years old. the forests of Germania, the object of Rome's policy of conquest and the location of the devastating defeat of General Varus in the year 9 AD. For the first time, the empire had to abandon a province, the territory between the rivers Rhine and Elbe. However, Rome's Waterloo was not as final as it was believed to be. The recent find of a third-century battlefield in Nordheim County in Lower Saxony reveals a large Roman campaign previously unknown. Hundreds of kilometers east of the Rhine, 200 years after Varus's catastrophic defeat. And yet there would be no Limes without Varus. Rome retreated behind the Rhine. Troops from the conquered provinces secured the border with the Germanic tribes. Next to Watchtower No. 1, there is a headstone close to the bank of the Rhine. At Rheinbrohl, across from Bad Breisig, was the start of the land Limes. The standard bearer of the 5th cohort of Asturians, Pintaios, a Spaniard, was 30 years old when he was killed. The Spaniard's death at the Rhine illustrates the multi-ethnic state that was the Roman Empire, which used to be bigger than today's United States. Yet the ancient power had realized its expansion could not go on eternally. It had reached its limits, both military and economic. Now it was necessary to mark its borders and secure them. The empire stretched from the deserts of Africa to the North Atlantic Ocean. Britannia was Rome's northernmost outpost, here, too, a wall, Hadrian's Wall, separated the empire's territory from the barbarians, as all non-Roman people were called. Battling the elements. The airship's start is delayed. Joachim Folk's team tries to cope with the squally wind. Again and again, the hull inflates like a gigantic sail. worried glances. A trial balloon is to make clear whether the two experts on the Romans, Christoph Schaefer and David Breeze, can ascend over Hadrian's Wall today. They have high hopes for their newly developed vehicle, which can hover extremely low and move slowly without raising dust, if the weather permits. But the rain forecast and their trial balloon say no. Like the balloon, they would be carried off course in this wind, at worst, out over the open sea at the end of Hadrian's Wall. The massive barrier stretches from the Irish Sea to the North Sea coast, almost 120 kilometers in the middle of North Britain's nowhere. Early next morning, the sky is clearer. There is budding hope with the scientists and pilots. The setup runs like clockwork. Every grip is well practiced. They want to make use of the morning calm as the forecast yet again predicts wind gusts. Joachim Vogt is checking the hull which is only a few millimeters thick. 
but they are going to entrust their lives to it. 3,000 cubic meters of nothing but hot air is supposed to lift them up. Liftoff at last, a world's premiere. Never before have the borders of the Roman Empire been flown along by an inflatable airship. David Brees has deferred the maiden flight over Adrian's wall to his German colleague, Schaefer. The wall on the basalt cliffs at Steel Rig. From above, Schaefer notices how perfectly the Romans made use of topography for their border. One of the 15 forts where the Roman army with its up to 12,000 men was stationed. In addition to these, there were 158 watchtowers, 80 fortified gates, and hundreds of miles of straight roads. Why had the emperor, who lent his name to the wall, ordered such a gargantuan effort? Were the rulers of the known world scared of the warriors from the highlands? Or did the wall have only symbolic meaning? The region north of Hadrian's Wall was comparatively sparsely settled, even in Hadrian's time. So the wall is hugely oversized regarding its role as a defense. There has been speculation about a representative function, but here too the question is, who would that be directed at? There was hardly anyone there. While inspecting the site, the two scientists encounter another mystery. The wall has holes. In regular intervals, fortified gates lead to the Barbaricum. Why was the border porous? David Breeze calls them mile castles because they secure a passage exactly once each Roman mile, which is 1,481 meters long. And he has an explanation. The number of gates are there to provide as much flexibility for the army to move around in the landscape. The Roman army didn't fight from the top of walls. It was trained to go out into the field and meet and defeat the enemy in the field. And it was superlatively successful at that. And this is how their strategy worked. Approaching enemies were spotted by the guardsmen, who relayed signals to the forts in the back. From there, quick response forces were deployed to encircle the invaders. Through the respective gates, the soldiers got into enemy territory exactly where the Picts were attacking. The Picts, the painted or tattooed people, as the Romans called them, proud, free warriors from the vast Scottish highlands. Like in Germania, there were various tribes beyond the Roman border. One thing they had in common with the Germanic peoples was their free and independent way of life. They didn't accept a central power like the emperor in Rome. Only in times of war did they elect a leader from their midst, a warlord. Things were totally different in the Roman camps, where order, discipline, and total obedience prevailed. Main factors for the empire's success. The auxiliary fort Vindolanda is one of the most fully investigated forts along Hadrian's Wall, maybe in the whole of the Roman Empire. For three generations, the Burley family have been digging here as its ruins are situated on their land. The headstone of a centurion, killed in action just like this legionnaire from the Caucasus who had his brains smashed in. The Highlanders knew how to defend themselves.
The Burleys found this piece of glass from Cologne at Vindolanda as well, painted with a gladiator scene. Luxury from a distant and different world. The most interesting find is the most unremarkable at first sight, thin wooden tablets. They are among the top 10 treasures, Britain's biggest archaeological treasures. In Barbara Burley's photo laboratory, we see why. Infrared images render faded ink visible. She deciphers intimate letters and shopping lists. Messages from the past that thrill her father-in-law. Chief excavator, Robin Burley. You know, the inscriptions tell you about commanding officers, governors of Britain, boring people like that. Here, you find out about the baths orderly, Attractus the brewer, the slaves, the wives. Absolutely wonderful. The wooden tablets reveal daily life in Vindolanda's garrison. The soldiers tried to escape their boredom with dinner parties and big game hunting. And we are even told the price of beer in the taverns. At the bathhouse, the ordinary soldier found pleasure in addition to cleanliness. Girls from the camp's village offered their services for a few sesterces, a diversion from having to endlessly stand guard. Hadrian's Wall, the border between the antique superpower and the free tribes, was not only a defensive fortification, it separated two entirely different worlds, just as the Limes did in Germania. But couldn't Hadrian have controlled the Highlanders with much simpler methods than gigantic walls and elaborate bridges? He gives the order to erect a monumental building at the end of the world. Only an emperor could have done this. And this, in turn, is an important aspect of his legitimacy and adds to his nimbus as the natural successor of Alexander the Great. But the huge stone wall was about to be superseded. Driving north, in 140 AD, the border with Scotland is advanced. The new man on the emperor's throne, Antoninus Pius, is trying to emphasize his legitimacy. Huge mounds mark the structure that bears his name, the Antonine Wall. The Romans were pragmatists, David Breeze explains. As building material, they took what they found in the area. Here, it was earth and turf, which they even used to build forts. An enormous effort, all for the reputation in Rome, especially as the occupiers retreated to Hadrian's Wall after only a few years. Even more mysterious are these holes. Archaeologists found them directly in front of the wall. Pitfalls, deadly barriers against approaching enemies. What was the superpower afraid of? Of those who elected their own leaders? Those who valued their free, wild land more than Roman civilization? Than laws and taxes, order and rules? Than the emperor cult? Was that the reason for this heavily guarded barricade? Roman emperors feared any forming of groups which couldn't be controlled by the central power. For instance, if whole tribes of barbarians intruded into the empire and consolidated their hold within its borders. To keep the barbarians in their territory, the Romans did not only rely on walls and soldiers. They also protected the border between civilization and wilderness with a kind of development aid. This silver treasure that was found in a Scottish hill fortification was probably used as a bribe for a clan chief.
At the laboratory of the Scottish National Museum in Edinburgh, the Roman silverware is put under the microscope. The x-rays show conspicuous traces of sword blows. It wasn't the art behind the jewelry that counted, it was its material value. The airship flies north along Hadrian's Wall. The scientists didn't spot any traces of a major attack on the structure. The Empire's strategy of combining scare tactics with gifts apparently worked. The legionnaires didn't like being stationed in Britannia, too far from warmth, wine, and the luxury of southern climes. Accordingly, one of the most coveted letters to come to Britannia on thin wooden tablets was the order for reassignment. The passage. The ships were not rowed by slaves, not as Hollywood and Ben-Hur want to have us believe, nor were their drums dictating the rhythm. Instead, there was the captain's whistle. The crews were made up of perfectly drilled soldiers, exercised in rowing and in fighting. If the wind was good, they set sails. From the channel, they sailed into another important connecting route of the Romans, the Rhine. Rivers were the highways of antiquity, ideal for a fast transport of troops. Free Germania, where Varus lost to Arminius. The battle was long seen as the Big Bang of German history. However, there were no Germans 2,000 years ago, and the Romans didn't completely withdraw from the area between Rhine and Elbe either. The newly discovered battleground in southern Lower Saxony is proof of that. Thanks to a spectacular find in Manching by the Danube, we know what the Roman ships looked like. Historian Christoph Schaefer and archaeologist Rudolf Askamp discuss an idea with excavator Klaus Michael Hussen. They want to recreate the battleship as authentically as possible. Using pictures of the wreck, they start reconstructing in detail. The shipyard Youth in Work in Hamburg Harburg takes on the challenge. Everything is done exactly like in Roman times. Even the pegs are consistent with their antique model. Shipbuilding Research Institute in Potsdam. In a 280-meter towing tank, the model of the hull on a scale of 1 to 5 is being examined for its streaming properties. The test drives yield exceptionally low resistance values, reason enough to test them on the finished replica. Within sight of the cathedral on Lake Ratzeburg, where Germany's Olympic rowers train. The maiden voyage is being tracked from above as well. These pictures will help later with the rowing analysis of the test crew, students from Hamburg. The boss himself is pulling his weight, working by hand on a ship filled with high tech. The airship looks downright ancient by comparison. All measurements are recorded via a satellite-based NX2 system that also helps optimize the America's Cup racing boats. One shot. The pace quickly increases from 19 to 29 strokes per minute, bringing the boat to a speed of five knots. The question is how efficient the warships were in securing the Empire's river borders.
On the third day, they already manage a very tight 180 degree turn in less than 30 seconds. At the same training session, they also set sail for the first time. It helps the rowers reach a speed of 7.4 knots. That's almost 14 kilometers per hour. A boat like the one we have here is a highly complex vessel. The nut and spring construction method provides for a stable shell, while its shape is truly sophisticated, allowing fast and tight turns. For its time, it was a high-tech product and technically superior to anything the locals could put forth. It was an immensely efficient weapon system. Schaefer's conclusion? With relatively few ships, the long river borders could be controlled effectively, while their Germanic tribes had to make do with simple rafts or dugouts. The lightning swift battleships had an easy job of it. And this is what they were protecting. Roman cities like today's Cologne, a copy of Rome. The stone cities were monuments of power and civilization which they had brought to the cold north. In free Germania, there was not a single stone building. The Romans, however, had their tammy. And wine and oil. The well-groomed Roman cleaned his oiled skin with scrapers, so-called strigils. He used tweezers to remove hair. Body hair was seen as barbaric. And he enjoyed his oysters with a special fork. Roman women's cosmetic products were made of precious, rather colorful ingredients. Pulverized lapis lazuli and azurite were imported in carboys. Roman propaganda tells us how they were supposed to imagine the dark barbaricum beyond the Rhine. The land is windy and cold and populated by wolves and bears. The Germanic people are gigantic and can hold their liquor. They drink day and night. They worship their gods at disgusting swamps using bloody rites. And when they aren't idle or drinking, then they go hunting. And they are ignorant, our neighbors to the north. They have a disregard for gold. They worship holy groves of trees rather than understand that the worth of a forest is to be measured in cords. That's changing, as the Roman Tacitus proudly reports. We have already made them accept money. They start clearing their land. The empire is insatiable in its need for wood to smelt metal, for example. In Sauerland, east of the Rhine, scientists found mines like this pit, which was in operation even after Varus's defeat. Lead glance, or galena, the raw material for the lead that was exported to the empire, as Michael Bode discovered through a new isotope analysis. original bars of plumbum germanicum, Germanic lead, traded at high prices and in great demand. Ammunition, seals and water pipes were made of lead, pans too. Salt can only be boiled spotless white in lead pans. Iron pans stain it red, while tin pans make it turn green. The Romans paid for the lead bars in cash as coin finds in free Germania prove. Denarii, sesterces, and asses were indeed soon valued as a means of payment beyond the border as well. As was Roman gold jewelry. 
Even the Mediterranean rite of providing the dead with a coin for the ferryman to Hades was borrowed sometimes. With the ongoing Roman presence along the Rhine, the Roman way of life definitively took hold on both banks. The Germanic peoples, too, adapted themselves to it, since they profited from the economic zones which developed around the garrisons, so it benefited both sides. Part of the economic zone along the Rhine was the Drachenfels, or Dragon's Rock. Although situated in enemy territory on the eastern bank of the Rhine, a highly coveted trading good originated here. Christoph Schaefer is walking along the slopes of the Drachenfels with specialists from the regional authority of Rhineland Palatinate. Their destination, a steep, rugged, strange rock formation. They show him a phallus chiseled into the rock almost 2,000 years ago. They interpret it as a bragging worker who immortalized himself here. Indentations and an incline down to the Rhine riverbank like a supersized slide. At its end, rough-hewn blocks of trachyte. The Drachenfels rock is easy to cut and ideal building material, and the Romans could transport it easily on the Rhine. Fascinating, the antique stonemason's tool marks are still clearly visible. Scientists were able to prove that the stones for the two Roman cities of Bonn and Cologne were quarried here. It wasn't only rocks that came from Germania. There was brisk trading across the border. When profit beckons, you make deals even with barbarians. Globalization two millennia ago. Rome also invaded land east of the Rhine to connect the middle reaches of the Rhine directly to the Danube. They constructed a fortified border in the middle of Germania, the Upper Germanic Ration Limes. In the airship, Vogt and Schaefer fly over the area where it began. Roman battleships patrolled down here. At that time, however, the Rhine was wider and flowed more slowly towards the North Sea. The reconstructed Roman tower at Rheinbrohl is the first of 900 watchtowers. The boundary line to the Danube also encompassed the fertile Neuwied Basin. the border wall ran over the hills of Westerwald. Archaeologist Cliff Joost from Koblenz, called the Limes Runner, has rediscovered the entire complex in Rhineland Palatinate with its sunken towers, ramparts and forts, meter by meter on his month-long hikes. In preparation for its designation as a cultural world heritage site in 2005. This is where Tower 14 stood. More than 100 years ago, it had already been excavated by the Imperial Limes Commission. Since then, its remnants have been lying hidden in the forest. The traces of their digging are still visible. The mystery of the Limes has left many questions unanswered. First and foremost, its function remains unclear. It is not only necessary to pose new questions about ancient times, but also to answer them using new technical capabilities. Yost and his team are examining one of the best preserved watchtowers, Tower Number 8, just a few kilometers above the Rhine. Its original walls are still standing head high. The archaeologists find very curious traces in the tightest of spaces. The V-shaped ditch is still visible in the soil profile. It ran behind the palisade. Suddenly it stops. What happened here? It's only 10 meters further on that it continues again. 
only an expert can sense how exciting a tiny black discoloration of the soil can be because it reveals the corner post of a wooden tower. Later, a stone tower was built above it. After 50 years, it collapsed. The original wooden foundation had sunk. A new stone tower with a deeper foundation was built right next to it. The gap in the ditch can be explained as well. Next to watchtower number eight, there was a border crossing that was 10 meters wide. Finds are proof of a strong military presence, lead shot, spearheads, and something special. A gilded dragon's head from the nearby cavalry fort Niederbieber. The attached windsock wriggles like a dragon and gave it its name. A cavalry unit was allocated to each section of the border to intervene quickly at hotspots. The airship above Roman Tower 8. It can hover low over the excavation site and provides a unique view of the two stone towers, the enclosing ditch, and even the investigative trenches of the Imperial Limes Commission. What is even more important to military expert Schaefer, during a quiet gliding flight, he can assess the strategic direction of the Limes on this terrain. In this part, it ran along a ridge which provided the Romans with a good view into free Germania, but also into their own hinterland. What catches the eye is a wide aisle, the first stage of expansion of the control line before the palisade, rampart, and ditch. There was visual contact between the towers. Fires relayed signals at lightning speed. From the wooden lookout tower at post number nine, there was a signaling connection down to the Rhine, but the experiment works just as well between tower nine and the hut at the position of tower eight. What stands out as well is the extremely good view into the Romans' own province, Upper Germania. This way, they could control the entire border zone. In the middle of Germanic territory, the Roman occupiers had drawn a heavily guarded demarcation line that could only be crossed at specially secured crossings. At high tolls, naturally. The fort's garrisons were not only alarmed about invaders, but also about groups of Germanic warriors returning from forays into Roman territory, before they could flee back to free Germania. The Roman border troops camp near Holzhausen. Hidden in the forest, the walls have been preserved at a height of several meters. The fort was built during the time of Emperor Commodus at the end of the second century AD, when the border was already threatened by invasions of Germanic tribes. Limey's runner Yost is fascinated by the unchanged rune and not just for scientific reasons. The foundation of the shrine for the standards, the center of any fort. Benchmarks for photogrammetric pictures of the main gate through which the second Trivurian cohort used to march. The crossing at the Limey's was only 400 meters away. With his studies, Yost archaeologically supports literary sources describing a growing threat to the border at the end of the second century. Holzhausen has stronger walls, deeper ditches, and artillery platforms on its corner towers. There are also deviations in the standardized constructions of all four gates and in the standardized structure of the fort itself. A square area with castellated walls that were six meters high. The headquarters building was made of stone, while the troops' barracks were half-timbered houses. The shrine for the standards, where the troops adulated the emperor. This uniform structure was the same at all Roman forts, from Africa to the North Atlantic.
but differing climatic conditions called for more flexible solutions. Germania's fogs turned the trumpeters into important signalers when fire signals were simply swallowed up. The original trumpets were found in excavations. Acoustic commands echoed far into the field. They relayed the general's orders in great battles as well. Like a spur, the Limes protrudes into the territory of Free Germania in the Veterau, northeast of Mainz. Why this needlessly long course of the border? One that had to be secured with many forts like the Salburg. Five twenty-three a.m. Sunrise on an almost windless summer morning. Ideal starting conditions for Joachim Vogt, flying towards Hochtaunus in the airship. And suddenly it lies beneath us on an ancient pass, the Salburg. Controversial among historians because imagination loomed large during reconstruction. However. The builder and his subjects in their forefathers' clothes liked it. The laying of the cornerstone by His Majesty Kaiser Wilhelm II on October 11, 1900. The Salburg was his favorite project. He approved all plans by his own hand. He visited the building site many times until the Roman castle proudly rose again on the previously excavated foundation. The Merlons, however, are too narrow, as they were built after medieval models, at the Kaiser's request. Despite all criticism, the Salburg is special. It is the only Roman fort that has been reconstructed to a large extent. The life of a Roman soldier in a military camp is vivid here. The return flight involuntarily leads over the Grosser Feldberg in Taunus as the wind picks up. The 65 horsepower engine is unable to cope with the gusts dictating the direction now. The airship is drifting over the fort on the Kleiner Feldberg, the highest situated fort on the entire Limes. The Romans used the mountain ridge as a demarcation line to include the Veterau granary in their province, protected by a palisade that was three meters high. The fence was made of tree trunks that were cut in half, their smooth side facing the Barbaricum. After the Great Wall of China, the Limes is the world's second longest ground monument. But it is only at first glance that it seems Rome had protected itself against the onslaught of entire peoples with this wall. Archaeologists discovered evidence for the danger at the border during the excavation of Coppersburg in Taunus. The camp had been gradually abandoned. In the end, the garrison had retreated to a quarter of the fort. The rest was left to rot. Experts call this stage of decline reduced fort. What had happened? On a field in Franconia, Bernd Steidel found an answer. The archaeologist from Munich has dug up the remains of two neighboring Germanic villages here. In one of the villages, he found well-preserved, apparently well-tended Roman goods, jewelry and coins that suggest good trade relations across the border. Germanic gods were worshipped in the neighboring village as well. But the longer he studied them, Steidel realized that something was different with the people next door. This Germanic tribe had zeroed in on the Romans' treasures of gold, 
on their jewelry and also on their bronze. The tribe was only interested in the raw material's value, not in their value as artworks. To them, this handsome young man was nothing but a pile of metal they could share as loot among their comrades. They were no friends of the Romans like the people in the first village. Merely two kilometers away stood the settlements of a Germanic tribe who had migrated into this region from the lower and middle Elbe River and who had proved highly aggressive. The bronze foot of a bed frame, the handle of a tablet, the lining of a harness, everything is hacked up and destroyed. The Elbe Germanic tribe stole everything they could. Steidel's conclusion, there were friends and enemies of Rome. The realization that there were two different groups of Germanic tribes, peaceful and long-established tribes, and aggressive newcomers, forces Steidel to reassess old findings. A Roman coin lined with gold, used as a pendant. The tribe from the Elbe didn't care about the engraved value of the coin. By comparison, a lead seal that was attached to a Roman delivery of goods to Germanic business partners. The arrival of the Elbe Germanic people at the Limes marks a turning point. After having been stable for decades, the border comes under pressure. The weakened empire is unable to effectively control the commencing mass migration any longer. After all, the Limes was no rigid bulwark. The empire's soldiers had to fight on too many fronts at the same time. Will they still be able to stop Germanic attacks on the Limes?